Hi everyone, this is the last day of our fifth annual conference of the IBCI. I'm very glad to have this as this panel and to moderate this panel uh, with Professor Lizan from Utrecht University and Daria from Moscow University and from uh, the BRICS Law and Policy Center. And it's so nice because I, I got into the work of Lizan uh, and a scholar conference, I didn't watch her presentation, but I read her paper about uh, different ways of framing innovation. And this is a fantastic question, a very hard question in interest in petition law. And then uh, we knew that Dari was doing a project in the BRICS Center about complexity, about innovation. So I think you're going to have a fantastic conversation uh, about this topic. And let's start with Daria, isn't it? So Daria, the floor yeah. is yours. Can I share my screen? I hope it yes. will be shared, okay. What, oh, oops, no, 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 sorry about yes. that. I was a problem sharing it, now it should work. Okay, so can you see my presentation like this? Yes. Uh, okay, so I have 25 minutes, right? Yes. Because I'm setting, setting up my timer. Uh, yeah, so hi everyone, and I'm really happy to present today on your conference. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, my name is Daria Kotova. I'm an expert at the BRICS Competition Law and Policy Center. For those of you who might not, might not know, this is a joint research platform of the BRICS Competition Authorities that was established together by them by declaration. And we are basically doing consulting and academic support for uh, the BRICS Competition Authorities. So today I'm going to talk about the kind of one part of complexity, which is diversity, and what role it has in antitrust, uh, meaning com having complexity science uh, in mind. So the thing is that this is one part of a bigger research project that we at the BRICS Competition Line Policy Center are currently doing with our partners from the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis from Austria. Uh, we are trying to kind of look at how complexity has place in competition analysis, especially as applied to digital markets, because we are kind of observing problems that regulators face when having to analyze competition in these highly networked industries and markets. So we're kind of trying to help, trying to, uh, try, trying to propose a new approach of looking to that. And kind of, uh, I can't always go like into much detail into our methodology and stuff because it's still work in progress. Uh, and we have a couple of papers that are, we are working on now that hopefully will be published next year. Uh, but for now, I'm going to focus on diversity as kind of a one side of our project. And the main like takeaway of the whole thing, uh, at least for now for this stage of the project is that we want to say that diversity really uh, as a value, as a concept in general, uh, without you know need to clearly define it for the purposes of our project, uh, can have a place in the competition analysis due to its huge impact it has both on the platform or digital ecosystem, which is kind of an intra-platform, intra-ecosystem level, and the impact that it has on the surrounding market, which is like an inter-platform competition level. Uh, supported by evidence that we have from complexity science. So this is like, again, as I said, work in progress. And uh, as of now, this is an invitation to discussion because the more advanced steps would be, of course, to gradually model diversity as well as other features of complex adaptive systems uh, to see how these models are applied to the digital context, again, with cooperation uh, from uh, people with complexity science background, complexity economics, and computational nature sciences. And I'm going to uh, stop a bit more on nature just in a couple of slides. Uh, so, well, first thing first, I think it's pretty clear at least now that complexity is definitely a signature feature of the digital economy. Uh, like we clearly see that power of platforms and ecosystems has really grown beyond the classical kind of economic market power definition. And uh, for those of you, for, for those of you uh, who know the recent papers of Yanis Lianas, he's been working a lot on that, proving that power now uh, in platforms and ecosystems is something greater than just, you know, economic kind of 
dominance. Uh, it's almost, you know, somewhere on the level of the power that state has over kind of all sectors of society. Uh, well, ecosystems, you know, in addition to that, ecosystems do resemble network structures more than classical industrial organizations that are kind of uh, organized in a more hierarchical way, uh, vertically, everything is pretty strict and linear, uh, as opposed to that, if we look at an ecosystem, uh, it will be often decentralized, at least it would look as a big decentralized system with number of numerous agents that are interacting in various modes, often non-linear modes, so it's really complex. Uh, again, in addition to that, they use a lot of data which allows to attract even more independent actors like me and you into these huge ecosystems, locking them in, uh, personalizing, personalizing and targeting new, new audiences. And to kind of support this case, I really love this quote by uh, Apple, kind of like recognizing and admitting that they really indeed are complex systems. Uh, well, you have it on the slide. I will just read the thing that I, uh, that I highlighted. Uh, that's their comment to the recent CMA market study on the mobile ecosystems. Um, I think the CMA has just published it like I don't know, a couple of months ago. So what they say is that the ecosystem should be analyzed and understood as a whole, not the way the regulators are doing it now, trying to you know, intervene here and there without having the full picture. Uh, another important thing that this quote says is that you know, that one intervention may have knock-on effects on other part of the ecosystem. And it's pretty much the same thing that you observe in complex systems when an external shock or just any other kind of external event uh, gets distributed either evenly or unevenly throughout the whole system. And you never know, and it really depends on the system that you have at hand, what exactly the impact of this intervention or this external event would be on some, you know, remote and totally disconnected part of this part part of the system so that's really important evidence from from the business so i mentioned nature in the very first slide so um the main thing is that if we want to look for complexity, if we, if we want to look for complex adaptive systems as a new potential framework for analyzing competition, well, the first kind of place where we should look for them is apparently nature and nature sciences, because ecosystems are present around us and they're like the most ultimate example of a complex system that um, you might think of. And that's well, that's the first point. The second point is that it's really, I mean, it's, it's easier instrumentally because computationally called and biology, they have advanced really to a huge level in studying the features of complexity that we have in ecosystems that surround us. All those predator prey dynamics, uh, biodiversity, and how it manifests itself in various um, instances. Well, these guys really have a very huge toolbox that we can at least, you know, borrow something from it and try to apply it to economic analysis that we're using competition. Uh, this isn't exactly like an original idea, but I mean, it, it could be original in terms of methodology, but the inspiration was uh, the famous piece. It's quite a short piece by James Moore. He's a, I think he's a Harvard analyst. He was a Harvard analyst at the time. Uh, I don't know where he is now, but still, this is a really influential piece uh, that kind of hinted that modern businesses, business ecosystems, and he coined the term business ecosystem, are kind of more intricate than one might think. They are basically networks that adopt certain strategies when trying to win the market. They either cooperate or they compete. And it really kind of uh, resembles this predator prey dynamics that we see in nature. And based on the choice of the right strategy, which is pretty much the same that an animal does in nature, a business can either succeed or it can just fail. So that was our source of inspiration. That's why nature. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll be really brief in here because again, uh, just reiterating that digital platform ecosystems will well, end platforms, but uh, what well, we think that now is better to talk about ecosystems as a series of uh, connected digital platforms. Uh, given that big businesses themselves themselves are trying are starting to tag themselves as ecosystems, they're pretty much the well, they look like the same, but they resemble complex adaptive systems a lot. Uh, they both are networks of differentiated agents that behave uh, interdependently and at the same time independently, but you still observe this emergent behavior that kind of um, makes you. I mean, you can't just 
assess the behavior of an, eco of an ecosystem by looking at its separate parts because separate parts together are what define the like the eventual behavior and the strategy of a whole system. So you really have to assess them as whole. Uh, again, agents interactions are non-linear. Uh, agents are connected with links of different strength uh, and the weaker the strand, the weaker the tie is, the more su successful it would be for the life of the ecosystem. And if we look to nature, flows of energy resemble flows of data, products of free dynamics resemble how complementers uh, interact with orchestrators within, uh, within an ecosystem, foraging strategies, which means how exactly ecosystems go out into the market to search for more food or resources, which is data again in user retention. So apparently there is at least some kind of similarity. Uh, because it's really too much, I mean, there are lots of similarities. So you really have to like, you know, pick one by one and try to decompose it and look at how it can uh, manifest itself in an ecosystem. We decided to look at diversity as just one property to look at when it comes to ecosystems. And I think that like the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the word diversity, at least for me, but I might be a little bit biased after this whole project has been going on, is certainly biodiversity. We have a biodiversity convention. We know that biodiversity is uh, the key to our sustainability and sustainable development goals. That's not just you know, an occurrence because uh, diversification, even in nature, is the key to success and survival and stability uh, from evolution. Because uh, if it hadn't been for biodiversity and genetic diversity, uh, we would have ended up with, I don't know, monoculture and earth uh, unable to sustain any other forms of life. Uh, same with financial, financial markets. Uh, there is an interesting research by Andrew Law from MIT who proposes to look at financial market ecology is basically an ecology, uh, supporting the case for more diversification. Otherwise, we will just, you know, find ourselves in a situation of the 2008 financial crisis when diversity lacked. So, uh, well, that's one thing. Uh, diversity indeed has a positive impact. Most often has a positive impact on stability, but we have to mind the diversity stability debate that's going on uh, yet in ecology and complexity sciences. But still, it's kind of close to consensus that monocultures, wherever, the, wherever one can find it, are more vulnerable to any kind of external attack or external shock. Um, well, we, and it's our claim, we apparently see lack of diversity in current digital market. I mean, it's not only digital, it can be any other market where innovation and technology has a very important Kind of stand, it could be, I don't know, pharmaceutical or any other uh, highly innovative market. Like where you have only big companies that follow uh, a more or less one development path, you would see diversity just gradually dying out. So uh, making a bridge to what I hope Zan is going to cover next, uh, diversity is really an important key to successful innovation. And uh, well, um, there is this really uh, influential ecologist, Stuart Kaufman, who coined the adjacent possible idea, saying that uh, more innovation creates even more innovation as it creates like more niches to innovate. The more, uh, the bigger, the higher is the multitude of approaches to innovation you have, the higher is the chance that more new niches would emerge. If you can like mentally picture it for yourself, it's like really the centralized structure, uh, a self-enduring cycle of innovation supported by diversity of approaches. Um, we know this one approach to economics and to economic analysis that tried to argue against the presumptions of standard antitrust economics, evolutionary economics, uh, as, and how it stresses that innovation actually occurs for recombination, and it really needs heterogeneity of inventors to always support this perpetual cycle of innovation. And uh, these guys, in they stress the importance of a, of a disequilibrium, of uncertainty, uh, and this is exactly the conditions where diversity would thrive. This is exactly, again, what happened uh, when the Earth was kind of taking its shape many, many kind of billions of years ago. Uh, for, now we have research, economic research from economics and management that kind of shows that we have low productivity growth because uh, innovation are just not really disseminated. They're often very proprietary, kind of locked in within a couple of big players. 
um, R&D pipes and they just don't find their way out to the market. Uh, these big companies don't have an incentive to innovate, but I think again, Lisanne will uh, cover this kind of in a more detailed way. So uh, there is a logical question that stems from it uh, that is for competition authorities. Uh, you really want the market to evolve, but how are you going to make it evolve and thrive if you don't have any kind of diversity, both uh, at the level of big ecosystems that we have in the market and at the level uh, of the market with this kind of market ecology. Uh, well, if we, I mean, yeah, we, we can see it as a problem, but then the other problem that we will face is how to demonstrate it and how to integrate diversity into competition analysis. And I think that the first, um, like the most important, but not the only one, but the most important uh, stumbling block that we have is the famous diversity versus efficiency trade-off. Again, something that we have both in ecology and in complexity science and how efficient really diversity is for a complex system. Because there is, in, there is evidence both from economics and from nature sciences that cost of managing diversity is higher for the system, for an ecosystem orchestrator, that it may, uh, to a certain extent, lessen the stability and resilience of an ecosystem because uh, too much diversity is never too good. The system becomes destabilized. Uh, in the economic context, we can argue that uh, diversity, and there is evidence that diversity is not economically efficient for digital platforms, especially for the big marketplaces that have kind of to bear the costs of managing it all. Uh, so this is one thing that further complicates our analysis. We really have to come up, apart from claiming for more diversity um, in the market ecology, we would have to come up with a way to calculate the exact optimum balance, kind of balance of diversity that would be enough to support both competition and the efficiency and stability of the system. We still don't have an answer to do that, uh, how to do that. And from the literature that I've studied, really no one exactly has the answer. But, uh, so there, this is something that we will need to work at. Uh, yeah, I think I will, I, I will skip this slide, but it just shows how uh, in one platform, in a digital platform, uh, you can see this rich get richer effect that really, again, is something that the platform needs to overcome in order to be more diversified. Uh, how one platform promotes one particular kind of goods, diversity goes down because goods and it could be like, uh, I don't know, content, goods, products, and whatnot. Uh, those that are less visible just go to the long tail of products that might never make it to the top. And you have just, what you have as a result is just the huge standardization of consumption. Uh, when the platform using algorithms and recommendation system would be just pushing a particular project, product to the top. Uh, we have some approaches on how to measure diversity. Uh, I mean, there are many approaches depending on the on who you talk to and depending on the uh, particular field that you look at. There are approaches to measure biodiversity and diversity in uh, separate complex systems. Uh, this one, uh, but like the kind of the core idea of, all, of, of almost all of those approaches is to look at diversity as something more than just variety. Because sometimes you would think of competition for it as saying, well, okay, you have a market and you have like, I don't know, five players in the market, which is fine. I mean, you have at least some kind of competition going on there. Or like there's 40 providers in the market, like perfect competition, no problem at all. But apart from looking at just variety, you really have to bear in mind that, um, for diversity theor like theorists, diversity is more than just a variety of something. You also have to have this variety balanced. You have to have elements in this variety not totally similar to each other because, well, that what's the point in having diversity at all? Uh, and this is like the the most fundamental idea if one wants to come up with a metric of how to measure diversity anywhere, including in digital markets. Uh, yeah, again, coming back to the intra-platform level and to how businesses themselves are, try are starting to understand that uh, having more diversity, having more kind of, you know, yeah, 
kind of a more balanced diversity of, uh, of, of what they offer in their platform, uh, they're starting to realize how important it is for supporting the resilience of their own business. Uh, this is a very nice case study example. And I have another example. Both of them come from China. I have no idea why Chinese are so concerned about diversity. Uh, so they have two platforms, uh, Douyin, which is basically a Chinese kind of branch of TikTok, and Kuishu, which is their uh, competitor. These guys have two different marketing strategies. Douyin uh, is, behaves like, like TikTok or Instagram. They just prioritize top content uh, and huge tons of content just is somewhere down there when no one has you know, access to it because no one, the, the feed just doesn't show it to you. Kuishu has a different strategy. It employs a Gini coefficient regulation where it kind of adjusts the amount of traffic certain content receives. And after content receives kind of too much traffic, the exposure just decreases so that more free traffic goes to uh, that kind of goods that are somewhere down there in the long tail. So they're kind of trying to more equitably uh, distribute the traffic and user retention between different kinds of content, uh, which is really important and a good example. But the problem is, again, coming to the diversity efficiency debate is that the UN is more economically efficient currently. Uh, they gain more money from, adver uh, from advertisers, they gain money from, from e-commerce because still competitors choose the platform that is more economically efficient, even though um, at the expense of more diversity. So that's something to think about, but at least they're trying to uh, argue for this case of increasing diversity of exposure. Uh, same with Alibaba, Ali, I'm sorry, same with, uh, with Taobao, which is a daughter platform for Alibaba. They're trying to use algorithms and trying to um, argue for more diversity on their platform, which demonstrates that platforms realize the importance of this case. And more importantly, they have instruments on how to influence uh, it in their platforms. So, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm almost finishing the like kind of most important question for us now, as I already said, is how to integrate diversity, how to frame it into antitrust enforcement, into the precise analytical tools that competition authorities use to assess um, to assess the market. Uh, and this is what the main avenue for the research is for, for us. But uh, it would be great. It would be great if you could, you know, think and propose of more avenues, more uh, ways of how to frame it. Uh, first of all, we really need to personalize diversity as a property of an economy or of an ecosystem. What it means beyond simple uh, variety. How we can explain it in plain language to the authorities, how we can model it. And then uh, modeling an antitrust case or modeling at least an approach to analysis that kind of shows that diversity can be part of the innovation analysis or even a theory of harm. Uh, just some very superficial and preliminary thoughts of how this can be done in, in, in unilateral conduct uh, Self-preference in cases might be the most evident example of where diversity can have a part because, you know, prioritizing one kind of producer is apparently could be bad for your diversity. Uh, and it decreases incentives to create varied products. Uh, for anti-competitive agreements, there is a potential possibility to divide markets between platforms based on content, plus, increasing, plus decreasing diversity of what content is available to consumers. I think that the European Union geo-blocking problems that they eventually then kind of managed to fight away could be something that is more or less similar to what I'm talking about. And of course, merger review, uh, and it was emphasized in the... Um, recent listening forum of the ETC by Lena Khan that Lena Khan that in mergers diversity considerations and the decrease in diversity of media, especially in media markets and in entertainment markets are huge problems that regulators really should start to, to care about. So the question again is how to integrate diversity into these innovation theories of harm or maybe just come up with a separate standalone theory of harm while well, this is something that we still need to think about. And this is my last slide. Uh, and it's like the, again, the most complicated thing. And I really love this quote by Joseph Farrell, that diversity from his, I don't know, it's like 10 years ago, asked you something, that diversity is the dark matter of competition. It's potentially very important, but it's really very hard to pin down and prove, albeit mathematically, uh, but or using models or something. It is in the air, but we really need to somehow kind of make it more, uh, you know, just comprehend it. Uh, Again, some ways 
just my thoughts on how we can do that. Uh, assessing how diverse systems are, which I think regulators are not paying enough attention to at least now, which means, for instance, measuring complementarities uh, between products in an ecosystem, measuring the strength of ties between complementary and orchestrator, uh, assessing how diverse markets are, which means going one step up not looking at an ecosystem, but looking at the market where an ecosystem operates, which means you already have innovation analysis and it's already really good that competition authorities start to uh, kind of use more and more of innovation analysis in their competition analysis and their market analysis, but enhance it with more dynamic metrics that are based on diversity, assess path dependence, see what mechanisms are in the market to select the kind of to, to assess the evolutionary selection process in the market, what, what innovations get to get into the market, who assesses that, or where is the bottleneck. Um, and finally, perhaps, and I know it's very ambitious, but kind of rethinking and readjusting the goals of antitrust a bit. Now we have uh, efficiency, well, mostly efficiency is part of the consumer welfare standard. Uh, as kind of one of the main goals of antitrust, we really, no, no, I'm not happy with it. We're trying to rethink it. So maybe if we have diversity as the basis for kind of resilience, which everyone is talking about resilience now, especially in a situation when market turbulence and like generally international turbulence is really great, then resilience really um, attains even a more important kind of, you know, feeling. So uh, calculating resilience of the market system based on the metrics of diversity could be really great way to readjust the goals of antitrust and see how antitrust and even revive antitrust, remembering how it can serve to increase the resilience of the market in general. So that's pretty it. And if you have any questions, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for them. And I'm really excited to hear Lizanne's presentation. Thank you very much, Dai. It was a fantastic presentation. Uh, showed us an uh, interesting way to analyze diverse uh, innovation by the by diversity. I'm gonna uh, refrain from doing commentaries, but I will do after Lizani speaks. So Lizani, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm gonna try and share my screen first yeah. because that's always the most problematic part of this. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, perfect. Yes. Um, well, first of all, thank you, Daria. I mean, um, I already know Daria uh, since Ascola, the conference this um, uh, summer as well, because we talked about complexity theory, because that's one of the other innovation theories that I'm working on. Uh, and uh, I'm also working on the diversity as a value. So I, I'm really looking forward to our discussion actually afterwards, uh, because I have so many thoughts running, uh, you know, through my head as well on what she said. And I think it's very interesting. And I'm very happy that Venetia has also organized this panel to discuss this uh, with us, because um, that's just uh, very exciting for all of us. Um, so good afternoon or good morning, depending on your time zone. Uh, my name is Isana Himmel and I work at Utrecht University. Um, I just, I'm going to talk about innovation uh, in EU competition law market power assessments. And I've been looking through uh, several economic theories that we can use to better understand innovation and integrate it in our competition law market power assessments. However, I do want to note that I'm a part of a bigger research project um, led by uh, Professor Anna Gerbrandi, um, and she is actually researching on something that uh, Daria mentioned as well, which is the broader power of for us big tech companies and how EU competition law should actually deal with that. Um, and it, we also think that the power of big tech goes beyond this economic power that we have known for the past couple of, you know, like decades uh, from traditional undertakings. And what my research project within that bigger project uh, um, is about is this uh, this argument that we keep hearing from big tech companies that uh, you know the, the that innovation is looming to disrupt them and the thing is normally we kind of ignore this argument because we think well it doesn't really make sense but I sometimes when I when you look at these uh, competition law decisions or or judgments 
innovation is always kind of pushed aside because it's just too difficult to deal with. And I'm trying with several economic theories to, you know, make sense of it and maybe help us go a, a bit further than just, you know, pushing it aside. Uh, so that's what I'm also going to talk about today. And I'm going to focus on dominant designs in the industry life cycle, which is not complexity theory, but it's a different theory that I've been working on. Uh, but first, I want to just, uh, and my presentation is not as flashy as uh, Daria's, which I think was great. Uh, so please forgive me for that. But what I first want to focus on is basically the contrast that we see between online platforms and EU competition law. Uh, because also, what Daria said is these online platforms, they're like uh, innovative and we, we very much uh, associate them with a dynamic environment, uh, innovation and, and it, this innovation that is going around in this environment makes it unpredictable, makes the future uncertain and makes those markets very fast moving. So it progresses over time. On the other hand, and I'm focusing on EU competition law, but I think it's actually true around the globe, is that our, our competition law or antitrust laws, they, they focus on compl something completely different, which is static efficiencies, so allocative productive efficiencies, which only focus on one point in time. So they're just not able to take into account this progression that you that you see with um, innovation and that, that you should actually uh, take into account, which is my opinion, when you're talking about these undertakings and when you're assessing their market power. Uh, so, so this is the, the thing that um, that is this contrast that we're trying to solve with looking to, to new theories and to maybe you know, make them fit better than they are now. So just to, I, I think a lot of people already know this because it's probably the same in other countries, but I just want to give you a short update on uh, what we do in EU competition law with innovation. Uh, so I'm focusing on market power in this presentation and market power, we conceptualize it as dominant positions, which we actually basically measure through market shares. So that's our main thing to measure market power. However, innovation can change those market shares, which can make it also very problematic. So when I was studying these decisions and these judgments, I could see different types of innovation that were taking or that were maybe considered in like such a decision as a competitive constraint on market power. So innovation as a general constraint, what I mean by that is that when you read a decision of the commission, they don't say it's a specific entrant that has this innovation or that is marketing an innovation, but they just call it innovation. Innovation is making these markets more fast moving, you know, but they don't say what innovation, what type of innovation or what company would actually market that innovation. So it's just general. And if you see that innovation as a general constraint in abuse of dominance cases, what the commission in their decisions and the, the court of justice, they, they also confirm that in their judgments, what you see is that innovation is not seen as something to constrain market power. So they just say, okay, you know, we see that they have high market shares. You say that there's innovation. However, innovation is not constraining that market power. So we can just rely on market shares. And that's something that, for example, happened in the Google shopping case as well. However, if you look in merger control, something else is going on. Because there, in very specific cases, which are often related to big tech, actually, they say, well, yes, we see market power, we see these high market shares, but those are actually not relevant because this is a very innovative environment. So that makes all those market shares basically redundant because they change all the time. So innovation is a competitive constraint of market power because all those market shares are no longer relevant. So that's, for example, the Cisco judgments, which, which um, is a, well, it's, it's a well-used example in EU competition law when it's about innovation and market power. So that's what we say in EU competition law about innovation as a general constraint. Then there's also something else, which is innovation as a specific constraint. And that's when innovation is actually seen as something that's going to be marketed by a specific competitor, a specific innovation that's relevant to the defined relevant market. And that relates to the doctrine of potential competition, which is also, I think, something that is, uh, is, is well relevant, at least in the US as well. 
So potential competition, it's not so much a doctrine that is about innovation, but it is about, you know, uh, could, could a potential competition, so a potential competitor that could enter the market within at least, well, I think maximum two years, could it be a competitive constraint to the market power of these, uh, well, of a company? If it is fueled, if, that's, if that potential competitor is fueled by innovation, they actually do take a specific innovation, a specific entrant that is marketing that innovation into account um, in their market power assessments or even just in their uh, theories of harm in merger control. So in that, in that sense, you know, you have innovation that is considered in these market power assessments as well. However, they can only consider it, and then I'm talking about the commission and the court of justice, to a certain extent, because it's only within two years. So you're not taking into account these bigger trends of what innovation, you know, could maybe uh, come beyond those two years. Um, and then I just want to point out this specific problem about killer acquisitions, which is, which is very much related to this problem as well. Um, until now, we haven't really looked at killer acquisitions in the EU. However, with uh, the Digital Markets Act, and especially in combination with article uh, with an, uh, guidance on the Article 22, we now suddenly, we already have two cases coming up uh, that we see are now basically killer acquisitions that have come under the review of the commission. So it's very interesting because that's like, um, that's maybe, you know, these smaller companies that are actually threatening these big tech companies, for example, the meta customer uh, uh, merger that has been approved, I think, already by the commission, that this, this small innovative competitor is actually, you know, threatening this big company, but they are allowed to take that innovation, they, they are allowed to acquire it at least. So what you see here is that they have trouble, or in the EU at least, we have trouble discussing this innovation and, and really understanding what it is and how to include it in our market power assessments because innovation is uncertain. And we as lawyers, but also economists, we don't really deal with innovation or we don't like to deal with uncertainty. However, we do see these markets, they are becoming innovative and they are becoming more fast, move, fast moving. So how can we make sure that these two things fit together? And that basically brings me to um, the industry life cycle and uh, the concept of dominant design. And this is a theory that I actually want to discuss today. So um, it is a very old theory, but it has been applied to platform mediated industries in the past few years. And uh, from an econ uh, economist uh, um, uh, perspective, it has it also works for these you know digital markets. So what it says is that all industries, they basically follow a similar pattern. So you have a startup phase, you have a growth phase, a maturity phase, and a decline phase. And normally you say that this is connected to profitability, about turnover, so you know your turnover and your profitability grow until it declines. However, you can also connect it to how innovation works in a market. Um, so what you see is in the beginning, you have very many different competitors with different designs. So they have, if I take the example, what I, I put on the slide as well, um, of all these different operating, mobile operating systems that we saw in the zeros or the 2000s, um, they actually were quite different in their designs. So they weren't as similar as we see on our mobile phones right now. And they were competing on innovation. So in this market, there were actually a lot of different companies with different designs. So it's kind of that diversity that Daria was talking about. If you, if you define it as a diversity of design, they were competing on innovation. It actually fostered a lot of innovation. And then Apple and Google entered the market with iOS and uh, Android. And that made it very interesting because what happened was that uh, first, iOS started with a full new design, you know, like the iPhones and everything that took over the market. But you also, like, basically simultaneously had Android entering the market, or Google entering the market with Android, where they opened up the operating system to third-party app developers, which was a big change in the market. And what you could see afterwards and then I can't really see my own slides because, yeah. Um, so what you could see afterwards actually was that these 
big companies that we know now know are big companies. So uh, Google and Apple, they took over the full market because all these customers, they basically merged to these dominant designs. So the opening up of the third party or of the op operating system to third party app developers and all the other operating systems either started copying them, they left the market or they were acquired of, by one of the two big platforms. So what you saw that a dominant design emerged and that dominant design was both of iOS and Android. All the other companies left the market. So there was a shakeout. And before that dominant design emerged, there was big competition on innovation. However, after the dominant design emerged, innovation didn't, did no longer constrain market power and they were competing on other factors um, and not no longer on innovation. So you saw that once the diversity actually left the market, you could see that there were no, was no innovation anymore. And while we, we still think of these companies as innovative, mar as innovative companies, if you think about it, what's ha what has really significantly changed about our operating systems in the well, past decade almost, not so much, at least not as much as happened you know, in those early zeros or early, early 2000s. So that's very interesting if you look on the core platform level. So that's when I'm talking about the operating system. However, this has also a lot of um, consequences for the ecosystem. So for the app developers that are actually dependent on that core platform. So in the beginning, so before you have a dominant design, before you know the, all these customers merge to these two platforms, to the, these main platforms, um, those core platforms just changed uh, change drastically all the time. And if you're an app developer, it's actually quite difficult to know what to invest in because you don't know if your, uh, your operating system will be taken over or will you know be uh, drowned into a new design within the next two years. So you're not really, you're kind of hesitant to uh, invest and really develop on top of a certain core platform. So it's not very that that innovation in the core platform market is not very beneficial for the people that are depending on it. So what happens once uh, a dominant design emerges, they know what to invest in, they know what to comply with. So all these app developers, they actually they're sort of shaken because on the market on top of the core platform, there are actually a lot of app developers suddenly merging towards these operating systems. It's a, like a, a, as a key turning point because they know what to invest in, they know what to innovate on. And uh, it actually attracts more complementary uh, firms. And it also means that there's much more innovation in the ecosystem. So the innovation actually moves from the core platform to the ecosystem. However, the problem with that is that the innovation within the ecosystem is always dictated by these core platforms. So it's the question whether we want that innovation or we rather want to have this innovation on the ecosystem. So it's just it just to show that it's not a linear story. Like the, the changes that you have on the platform, they also have consequences in the ecosystem as well. So we need to look at it from a whole ecosystem perspective and not only a core platform perspective and not only an ecosystem perspective, what we often do in our EU competition law cases right now. So then the question is, this is a great theory and all, but what does it mean for EU competition law? Because that's always, I think, the difficult step if you look at these theories, what does it mean and what should we do with it? So I'm gonna start with the easy one because I like that, uh, the abuse of dominance. So um, because in EU competition law, we are relying a lot on market shares, um, we could use the market phase that the market is in as a complementary factor to see how we should value those market shares. Because if there's no dominant design, so if there's still a lot of innovation in the market, if there's this diversity and there is a lot of competition between these, these companies, market shares are not really relevant because they can be taken over quite quickly when there's a new, you know, dom when there's a new uh, innovation or if there's a dominant design coming. However, once there's a dominant design, we cannot ignore that market shares are important. So we shouldn't really listen to those big tech companies anymore. If they have actually have a market share, 
or high market share, we should just say, yeah, well, innovation is no longer really relevant uh, in this market. So we're just going to ignore your arguments. But at least we, we can um, uh, substantiate why we say that in our judgments. Um, so dominant designs, it's something that you can basically determine through customer and market surveys, because there are certain criteria that I'm not going to get into today. Um, and that already works within this whole process of uh, competition law investigation because they do a lot of customer market, customer market surveys. So they can just take that uh, into account when they are doing those surveys. So I think that is just that that works within the whole system. Um, for merger control, so dominance has a bit of a different um place in merger control because it's not only about dominance it's about pre and post merger market shares and it's also about the theories of harm that um, Daria already talked about so for the part that it is about establishing dominance I think we can just copy paste the approach that we have for abuse of dominance and we can just take it into account as um, a complementary factor However, and that's why I was talking about uh, killer acquisitions before I think there's something we can learn from the industry life cycle about killer acquisitions. Because you see this normal pattern of the market and you see that there, when you're merging towards a dominant design, if that's, and that's the question, if we want diversity, maybe we should actually prevent uh, a dominant de design from emerging, but that's a whole normative um, discussion that we might <laughs> want to uh, discuss later. But if, if we see that the market is merging towards a dominant design, all those mergers and acquisitions, they're actually just a natural movement of the market. And that's something maybe we don't want to disturb because we want to uh, foster effective competition. So all those killer acquisitions that we're talking about, maybe they're not so much killer acquisitions, but, but they're just natural and they're supposed to happen. However, if you have an established dominant design for a long time, and you see this up and, come, up and coming new competing design that might disrupt the market because you see that, you know, those criteria that I was talking about, but I, I didn't uh, elaborate on, if they're slowly changing towards another company, maybe that would be a killer acquisition because that's actually the point of, um, you know, a disruption in the market that we want to happen. So it is just a, a different way of thinking about it. And maybe it's something we couldn't take into account once we see all those killer acquisitions uh, coming up in the, couple of, in the next couple of years. Um, and then the next point, that's my last point actually for today. Um, this is about the ecosystem. And that's also why I wanted to talk about the ecosystem before. Um, we see that we talk about these app developers often, and especially in those app store practices that we see in the EU right now, as uh, small companies, you know, that are you know, victim, fall victim to the, the big app store practices and that we should protect. However, because these companies have been investing for so long, sometimes they're actually quite big companies. So they're, you know, like Epic, for example, which is just a big gaming company in itself, or Spotify, which is also just a big company in itself. And while we want to protect them, we should also maybe look at how much they maybe are countervailing power to these big tech platforms, or at least to the core platform. Because for example, if you see the Epic versus Apple, um, uh, well, fight over the past few years, Epic was quite a countervailing power to uh, Apple because they really questioned the app store practices. And I think they, especially with also the, the complaint that, the, um, uh, that Spotify, for example, made to the EU commission, they started or they ignited this DMA part about app store practices that Apple is now constrained with. So you see that within this, this ecosystem, there's actually some sort of counterpower to these platforms that we maybe should also take into account in our, um, uh, in our market power assessments, because it's just not as simple or, or linear as we think now. So just the relevant market and horizontal competition, but maybe we should look at different levels as well. Um, so yeah, just the final, uh, my conclusion, how can we make it more fit for purpose? Well, I think that these theories are never the complete solution because we need to kind of marry economic and innovation studies um, uh, together with law, which is also always very difficult. But I think 
it actually help us, it, it might help us come toward a solution, especially also with uh, complexity theory as well, and maybe other theories that we don't know yet uh, to uh, better integrate innovation into our uh, market power system. So thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Lisa. It was fantastic. Uh, I know that uh, you have uh, you can uh, uh, discuss with each other, but I want to just uh, do some questions, and you, you can uh, discuss uh, other things also. But one thing I uh, I was I, I would like to, co to comment is this idea between static and dynamic uh, efficiency, and this because uh, maybe the and I think Lizanne showed us that it's possible to use both theories. Like, with, uh, if you use dominant design theory, you still assess complexity and still have this, this thing about uh, uh, using complexity and trying to uh, in, uh, frame innovation. But uh, do you think uh, uh, diversity is something that is possible to use as a bridge between, like, the traditional static efficiency and the dynamic uh, uh, efficient because if you there is some some people that could say like if it the if you try to to do so very dynamic and very long term efficiency maybe it's better not to intervene in the traditional uh, position by sh not new Schumpeterians but Schumpeter or some um, uh, um, another uh, point uh is you, you said like uh, in the post dominant design moment when there is like a natural selection to keep the the metaphor with uh, biology or uh, and like the two or three uh designs uh, appear as dominant you have uh the idea of uh winner takes all and takes most uh, economy because it's one or two winners that's gonna make this process of natural selection is going to have a dominant design. Um, but if you think outside ecosystems, maybe, for instance, like if you have like, if, if, uh, if face, Facebook and Instagram, they are on the same company, of course, they have to interact with Android and with Apple, you know, with iOS, but it's if if they are different products and maybe they have a different kind of management. One of the startups that's bought by by Meta or by Google or by, or by one big tech has the possibility to be independent. It's going to still be diversity because uh, I don't know if uh, the ownership and the corporate uh, think is so important. If I if I am a, a consumer and I look at my cell phone and say, oh, I can post this or use this social network or Instagram or Facebook and sure there, and maybe there is diversity uh, or not, uh, Daria, what do you think about? So this is my first questions for both of you. I don't know what trains first. It Shall matter. I just start? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, like, because, but basically, they're they're both a bit, I think, the same because it's about diversity as a value in competition law, and I think there are a couple of problems. Well, what I see. So, first of all, when it comes to EU competition law, we don't have diversity as a value, but we have, you know, uh, effective competition. We have uh, the market structure. But I think that there's also been um, there's been a move to maybe integrating other values into, you know, our our goals of competition law or antitrust goals. And I think that diversity is something we need to think of what we want our market to look like. And what we always say, or at least in the EU, if you look at their policy documents, you always see what well, we really value innovation, we really want it. And if we just look at the markets and especially digital markets for the past two decades, there has no, not really been diverse or 
there has not really been a lot of innovation because that innovation has just been taken over by all these companies. Um, and, and it's not really, you know, going towards the consumers anymore. So if diversity is the way to really bring innovation back into the market and back to these consumers, maybe we should that put that value above, you know, like, oh yeah, it's more efficient if you, you know, like if you have Instagram and all these other companies under one roof, so they have like efficiency among them because we want something else and I think that's just more of a normative decision that uh, somebody needs to make or somebody than the regulators need to make um, and maybe not even with competition law but it should happen with regulation but I, I think that you first could see um, uh, you, you could see diversity as some sort of bridge to maybe make sure that we uh, put innovation back on the agenda and make sure that there's innovation back in the market. And uh, well, maybe it's better not to intervene. What we see now is that we actually do experience problems, I think, of, across all jurisdictions in digital markets. So uh, even if it is better, because that's also the whole Schumpeter Arrow discussion, is it better you know, to have competition for innovation? Is it better to have a, a big company for innovation? I think what we see now is just a problem that these companies are so big. So maybe, uh, is it better to inter intervene? I actually think so, just if you look at the state of the market, uh, but that's also more of a maybe normative thing that we should discuss, you know, and, and decide on together. So Daria, I'm, I'm curious to hear what you think. Yeah, thank you. So I think that um, my answer would be pretty much close to what Lizan has just said from the value kind of based point of view because uh what you're asking basically is what i pointed out i think in my like very last slide that you really need like yeah you have static efficiencies and you have dynamic efficiencies and you kind of want to care for both of them but i mean if at this given point of time your market is efficient well what, what's the problem but i think it's exactly the problem the key to the problem exactly is is resilience because you want your market not to be efficient now for this consumer at this point of time you want your market to be resilient like for decades to come and this is where diversity can step in and just explain i don't know using models or using value-based language that this kind of normative underpinning of antitrust and the rethinking and redefining of the goal that antitrust is pursuing is exactly your answer to kind of having both static and dynamic efficiencies at the same time. Because, I mean, if your market is going to be diverse and efficient in the long term, apparently, I mean, it should be efficient and diverse in the short term. I mean, this is how the process goes, at least to me. And, um, Coming to your second question on diversity, like if you have already Instagram and you have Facebook and I mean, what's the problem? They're on the one roof and they're quite efficiently managed. Uh, yes, they are. But if you remember, and again, it's again about resilience. If you remember, there was a case, I think one year ago when Facebook had a major shutdown in its servers and you couldn't access Facebook, you couldn't access, I think even WhatsApp had problems, you couldn't access uh, Instagram, and people just went to Twitter because it was like the only platform that didn't experience the shutdown thing. And it perfectly kind of demonstrates how it is really important to have diversity in the market. Like if something shuts down, something is too, is too big to fail because it's exactly what happened to Facebook one year ago, you really have to have um, other competitors in the market and even if you look like again uh borrowing metaphors from nature like yes in nature you have kind of i wouldn't call them like dominant design but you definitely have species that are more efficient than others that's how evolution goes but if you kind of zoom in an ecosystem and you would see that there are lots of like really weird i don't know small beings that are not that efficient that are like really clumsy and whimsical, but they're there for a purpose because they have their, they have their own niche. They might be, you know, just food for some higher species. And here we have killer acquisitions that are not so certain because sometimes they're just natural process. Everyone always feeds in someone in nature. It could be the same in the market. And you just have to kind of give space to all possible niches and then just, well, try and let the market regulate itself. But then, well, with you know certainly with some intervention from the state so that's it at least for me 
Thank you, Dave, for that. And like, uh, I will, I will speak like that. If uh, I think it's very interesting to think about these two moments. It could be like I don't know, uh, uh, after and before tipping point, or after and before. Uh, it's I think it's a better framework after and before dominant design takes place. And I think uh, there is a, a role for. Uh, for competition authorities to like differentiate dominant design and exclusionary design, like uh, well, because maybe it's a continuous process. You have uh, some platforms, some ecosystems. They have a, a, a fight. Then the state must not choose the winner. The some kind of way of the market does it. Uh, not totally uh, uncoordinated, but. Uh, without uh, state, without well, the state, what without regulation? Sometimes, sometimes maybe the state choose on one standard, but maybe it's not that, that good idea all the time. And after that, there is the dominant design point where you have to interact in that ecosystem. And when that happens, uh, uh, the, the competition authorities should intervene more in the way this dominant design works. Uh, because probably it's going to work in a way that new challenges will have more trouble. So uh, do you think it's important to keep this possibility of a new dominant design uh, in the, the competition uh, in, uh, uh, work? I, so what you see with dominant designs is that they're often chosen by the market so they it, it's just it's i think and now i have to do it by by heart because i don't have my notes about the the criteria here but it's normally that it it is a design that freezes the socioeconomic context it is uh the preference of most of the customers and there's a third one that i forgot because i don't have it with me but um uh, so what you see is that these customers even if it's not the best design because that's also very important it's not dominant design is not always the best design in the market but it's just the one that most people are attracted to and move to and for example especially with platform mediated industries you see that uh, they become the dominant companies as well because it's just with network effects the tipping points what you said but what you saw before actually platform mediated industries um, a lot of their uh, dominant design didn't necessarily mean that there were dominant companies uh, the first dominant design or the example that's most used is the Ford Model T from 1925 is basically the model car that we still use but there are just a lot of companies that kind of had like these very specific differences but they all copied the basic similar design about the engine the steering wheel the clutch um, of the Ford Model T so you saw that there was actually diversity still in the market maybe not on the design but on different you know different um, uh, aspects of of the car or of competition price quality uh, and different types of designs uh, but that's just something we don't see in uh, platform mediated industries. Uh, so do I think that um, uh, that regulators should intervene after a dominant design? I don't necessarily think so, because it's something that the market chose, which is OK, which is good, which is competition, which we just should allow. However, there are points uh, within this era of dominant design where there are problems or market failures. And I think that we should maybe devise some sort of innovation market failure where, you know, the dominant company basically erases all innovation from the market because it's just all merged to one company instead of just only one design. And that's the point that maybe regulators or even competition authorities uh, should see or should be more strict on how these companies behave in the market, how they especially behave towards new entrants, and maybe also regulators how they regulate the market and maybe they should be more likely to intervene but i don't think that's necessarily always after the point of dominant design but it's more likely to happen if a dominant design has existed for a very long time so i hope i answered your question with that answer can i just add here something here i mean it's not like um it's an additional remark and i think it might transform into a question to Lizanne, but i'm really interested like yes i also think that 
you keep, it depends on the market situation. Sometimes you really have to intervene after the dominant design. And again, sometimes the dominant design becomes too invasive. Again, bringing, bringing up metaphors from nature. Sometimes you have invasive species. And it might be efficient, it might be super efficient, but it might be even sometimes good for their ecosystem. But at some point, it's so much of these species, you really have to do something to, to, to get rid of it, to eradicate it. But my question is, um, like, how do you, how do you, before this tipping point occurs, how, how does the dominant design theory, what does it offer for this tipping point, uh, like, not to occur at all, which I think is not possible maybe, or to occur in such a manner so it doesn't kill off like all innovation that has been previously out there in the market. I mean, uh, are there any kind of your own ideas or maybe there is something that's kind of enshrined into the theory that can help you kind of uh, come to this tipping point and pass it as smoothly as you can. I hope it's clear. Yes, yeah, so I, I think that there's nothing, so first of all, there's nothing in the theory that's more, it, it's more descriptive theory, and that's why I specifically focus it on market power assessments, because it could help us only within that, because there's nothing that uh, has like a normative judgment on whether this tipping point is bad or good. It just happens. It's descriptive. Um, uh, if so, that and that's also why I'm looking at other theories, for example, complexity theory, to maybe explain like what we should do before this dominant design happen and happens, and what after what should happen after this dominant design. So I think that the dominant design, especially when you look in platform mediated industries and these complementers that depend on the core platform, it's, it's not bad. It's not bad that there are just industries where there is for a certain time, not that much innovation because that is just the way the market works. However, there is, I think, a turning point in that, you know, like stability or this maturity stage of the market where it becomes invasive, like you say, like these invasive uh, species, because it's killing, you know, new innovations that might be, you know, because this, this pattern, it's like always revolving, right? Because then once the, the they are in the decline stage, then there's a new innovation and they start like these new companies start in the startup and growth phase again. So there's uh, we should prevent that these uh, big tech companies, which are what I'm talking about, or these big uh, platforms, they don't prevent this disruption from happening. They don't prevent this transitioning to this new market. And I think dominant design theory doesn't really say anything about that, but I think actually complexity theory says a lot about that. And uh, that there are some things that we should do and I think then you come to diversity that there are actually cases where you say, well, maybe we shouldn't approve this merger because we value diversity more than the freedom to acquire, for example. And that's the, I, I think that's more of a theory that could help us in the post dominant design. And I think that the pre dominant design, that's just something that is a natural movement and that happens because it also has a lot of benefits for the market. So I hope that I answer your question uh, with that. Yeah, and can I intervene just one more time? Uh, so what I really liked in your presentation is that you mentioned these industry life cycles. And that's something that we think and what I think personally is very much missing from the current competition analysis. like. Uh, again, everything develops in cycles, and even if you look at ecosystems and nature, they too develop in cycles. Uh, and if you look at the emergent business ecosystems literature, again, back in the 90s, but even now, like works of Wagner and I think Jakobides, they also mention it, that business ecosystems also evolve in stages. So they kind of, they emerge, then they mature, then they, at some point, they start to disrupt the market if they can. So it's only like if the competition for it is tried to adopt this life cycle mode of thinking when they're analyzing the market, everything would be would become so much easier for them. Like you could have caught this WhatsApp double click merger when the Google ecosystem has been or Facebook ecosystem has only been on its premature stage. And like if you could have caught it or approved it with certain commitments, that would be perhaps better for the situation that we have now but what they are doing they're just intervening at the kind of 
stage of expansion when not, not, not even expansion, I think it's already post expansion that they have bought everything they could have bought. And the regulators are like, oh, okay, we have a super big invasive species in our ecosystem and trying to kind of in a very, you know, kind of weird way to act on it and to do at least something. So mentioning, I think mentioning life cycles of an industry, of an ecosystem is really something that we should, uh, yeah, diversity should also be one, be one of the element. But just kind of trying to explain regulators that everything evolves like this, if you show it in a graph, that's really a very good way, I think, of, uh, you know, rebuilding your competition analysis. It's a very good point. Yeah. Thank you. I, I actually have a critique on myself <laughs> or on this, this complexity and this industry life cycle because I was talking to economists from the Dutch Competition Authority lately. And, you know, I, I think if you look in the basis, and I think that's also in different or other jurisdictions, it's the same. You are starting from defined relevant markets, right? I mean, and you always look within those relevant markets and maybe some effects on other defined relevant markets, but to make sure that you're, you're determining market power, you need to have small markets. However, if you're looking from a complexity theory perspective and an industry life cycle perspective, it's not always a perfect, you know, like this, but it's a niche that suddenly comes and cuts the whole curve. And it's very diff difficult to to you know like um, predict this and then also have enough evidence in a case to actually prove that this is happening or to show that this is happening and that's something that I'm currently struggling with as well because how can you make sure that these undertakings are actually you know like um, they, they know what they're they're up against and they know what they're going to get in these competition uh, uh, law proceedings. Uh, so there is some sort of legal, legal certainty, um, but you do integrate these more uncertain theories like complexity. And I think that's something I'm struggling with. Um, and uh, I, I don't know, Daria, do you have the same feeling that it's quite difficult to integrate these more vague theories in this like more legal um legal assessment so that's kind of also a question to you yeah yeah uh, well certainly of course we have the same problem because there is nothing as you said there is nothing ideal like you really can picture it like this but it now works this way and there is exactly this is the point where complexity economics should step in because they do have the instruments to forecast and to model for instance they use a lot these agent-based models that kind of can forecast how the market agents will behave under various scenarios this is complicated i believe this is quite expensive for competition authorities it really requires huge expertise but it shows i mean well these scenarios and these forecasts again because of huge uncertainty it might not always be true of course uh, they need to be calibrated but like at least they show the dynamics of the market under various scenarios with very various variables at least that's how i understand how this whole thing works because it's really too complex for me but i think that um kind of readjusting and changing a bit your toolbox, maybe moving more into this complexity uh, and computational toolbox and instruments what might help them. But again, I mean, that's just me theorizing. And I think when it comes to real complexity economics, there is even more caveats that we just don't see. So it would be really great to discuss it more with complexity economists who actually make these models, because I've seen a couple of interesting papers that simulate mergers. You know, they have this pre-merger situation and post-merger situation. So they are, they're, start, they're starting to do this. And maybe if this is, gets disseminated, well, maybe we will see a change, at least in how enforcement goes. Yeah, no, fantastic. I agree. Uh, maybe potential competition is not so important as pot potential diversity, uh, like, uh, because what one protects is not just another competition that, that uses the same uh, kind of model or same product. You want to have a choice and choice between two different models, two different uh, uh, companies that have different technologies. And, I don't know, maybe, I think it's very hard, like, 
I agree with both of you. Like, how do I assess that in a legal reasoning that's predictable? Uh, what is a dominant design? What is an exclusionary design? Or how can I do a, 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 a trade-off between efficiency and diversity? And what is the the the, the pattern? Like, am I willing to make a, a sacrifice of efficiency? Uh, because the the base economics would say that companies that have no consumers are inefficient. They should go to bankruptcy. So you can say no. And when you say you have, uh, it's important to keep this to not because not it's not aiding the company, but to keep this technological uh, alternative viable or uh, uh, not enforce a, a, a contractual clause that excludes this company. Uh, uh, I think maybe it's hard, but uh, I think you both of you are the good path of knowing the, knowing the problem, discussing the, the patterns and the solutions. So uh, it's fantastic. And this is something interesting, I think, also in the, but you mentioned Brazil and like uh, this, this, these platforms, they have the same thing for everyone. Uh, every country, like uh, the, and this is another thing. Like, uh, if I, if there is a diversity of 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 anti -threat, a competition, law enforcement, or different uh, uh, remedies, uh, but I think it's very hard to have. Maybe in the states and European Union, they can have a clash. But if you think about minor jurisdictions and try to enforce like. I'm gonna say that this uh, design that uh, iOS uses or Android uses is, is exclusionary and you have to change your design. Uh, to protect a, a Brazilian company, for instance, that is a, a, a viable alternative and must remain in the market as a as the sake of diversity. This is gonna be, I think, very hard to, to see in the near future, but uh, I think we have time for more final uh, less less considerations from design from Daya. We have more fifteen minutes. I don't know if I want to say uh, one final remark for everyone. Well, just um, also coming back to what you said, Finicius, because I think that's also something we have to be careful uh, for, like the, um, we shouldn't protect smaller, less efficient competitors necessarily um, with, you know, like protecting diversity. However, there are, there, there might be um, uh, some situations where we uh, should actually do that. And that would be a very, like a change of pace and a change of, I think, also our frameworks if we're going to do that. And But there are so many caveats that we would uh, have to make if we want to do that. So I think that's something that um, I don't see it happening very uh, quickly. And I'm not sure if it would happen that it would actually be uh, good, but I think that uh, you could also see that efficiency is measured in different ways, and maybe they're not as efficient in terms of, you know, prices or or quality, but maybe they're more efficient in innovation or um, in just a whole different business model. So maybe we can also think about efficiency in another way to solve that problem. Um, then also just about the smaller jurisdictions, because I think that's very interesting, because even for the EU, I think it's a big jurisdiction, but it's still very difficult to enforce something against these big tech companies. Um, I, I'm, I'm personally from the Netherlands and there has been, um, I think our, our Dutch competition authority, they actually uh, find uh, Apple about, or, or Apple, I think about some app store practices and we are a very small jurisdiction and we are actually in the EU. So you could do that, but the question is how far do you get with that? And I think that big tech companies might now be more, um, might, might, might now be more open to, you know, like smaller jurisdictions finding them because it's a prelude or preamble to what the bigger jurisdictions will do. Because if the Dutch Competition Authority did it, they probably did discuss it with the EU. So, you know, these, these big tech companies might know that they might be in trouble with the EU if they don't comply with the Dutch authority. However, I think that's very difficult that we have very big global companies 
and very diverse <laughs> um, uh, competition authorities that are trying to enforce different rules on those big tech companies as well. So I, I think that's something that will always be um, a problem if we look at the enforcement of digital markets. However, I do see that there are big strides that are, are being made now as well with just regulations just popping up everywhere that do are that they do seem very similar and hopefully they bring these big tech companies to opening up to innovation uh, as well and uh, yeah I'm also very just very much looking forward to seeing where all the research on complexity um, economics will go because I think it can really help us in these uh, well big problems that we experience right now with um, digital markets and especially innovation so Daria I don't know if you want to say something final yeah, I have actually have a lot of a lot of things to say, but I hope we'll um, get more chances to discuss it. Uh, so as for, I mean, for protecting inefficient, inefficient competitors, well, again, it's the whole thing of how you define diversity, because as I said, it's not merely variety. You really have to look and that's I mean, very right way to uh, to frame it that Lausanne did. Look at how they like at parameters where they might be efficient. Uh, as in my example with these two Chinese platforms, yes, one is less economically efficient and it really kind of um, fails to win this battle for, for for the market, but it actually won the market, it's, it, won, it won its target audience. So it occupied a niche and maybe for the competition for it, I know it's complex, it's again, it's complexity. Uh, it's, com it's, it's complicated to try and uh, get to, to count for many variables, not just, you know, uh, the degree to which they can influence price, for instance, on the market or the degree to, we, to how many market shares they have. But they really need to try and think of ways to implement tools to trace like how exactly this company behaves in the market, what niche it occupies, how this niche is positioned against other niches and against the dominant players. It's a very complicated thing to do really because the market is complex, but that's that's what they have to do if they want to have a real understanding of what diversity is. And coming to, this is my last point, <laughs> coming, to the, uh, coming to the smaller jurisdictions, we have actually been having and are having um, a very burning discussion within our project group on whether fragmentation of the regulation of digital ecosystems and platforms that we have now, whether it's bad or good, like, do we have to strive for one unified approach in antitrust or do we have to leave it as it is, the diversity of approaches? But like, it's real because we have some more or less successful examples. We have examples, for instance, in South Korea, where they forced Apple to, Apple, I think, and, and Google, both of them, uh, to stop and their African app store practices, payment practices. Uh, they finally failed to comply, as I recall. So now they have to investigate them uh, after they passed that law. But at least they tried to protect one separate market. They did the same in the Netherlands, I think, with the, with the data apps, right? Uh, they wanted to protect, I mean, that that's because of how antitrust works. They only had to comply in the Netherlands with respect to the Dutch app store, with respect to the Dutch um, data apps. So, okay, you protected that segment of the market, but it actually increases uncertainty for both the companies and for regulators because you have this in one like corner of the world, you have compliance. In another corner of the world, you don't have compliance because approaches are differentiated. And the more, I mean, uncertainty is good at some point. It is good for diversity because they kind of mutually reinforcing. But uh, at some point, too much uncertainty is, is just as bad as too much diversity. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's a discussion for another day, but thinking within this complexity framework, thinking of how you have to frame the global regulation, and if you have to enrich the global regulation with complexity, is just another thing that, you know, to think about on the sidelines of this whole topic. Thank you, Dara. So we have to do another panel in some months, eh, about, some months about uh, complexity in regulation, not just in the market. But I learned a lot today and it was fantastic as I expected. Uh, fantastic presentations and fantastic considerations and a, good, a great debate. So thank you very much, Lizanne. Thank you very much, Dara. It was a pleasure to have this panel.
and I hope uh, you have a nice weekend. Thank you very much. And whoever is uh, the audience is gonna ha we're gonna have a final panel uh, on the after lunch in Brazil time with Chibo. That's gonna end the, the conference. So please watch the next and final panel of the conference. Thank you very much. Bye. Ciao. Thank you.